Welcome back, pro wrestling fans. Welcome back, IWC. It's me. It's me. It's the GOC with another special edition of Chaos Corner here on Guardian of Chaos, the YouTube channel. Coming to you live to tape 25 feet below the surface of the earth. Wait, wait, wait. We go through this on every episode. I'm live and I'm taping it at the same time. What a conundrum. Ah, fuck it. You guys get the idea. I'm just glad that you're here on uh, today, this date in pro wrestling history for November 22nd on Thanksgiving Eve. We have a lot to be thankful for. I know there's a lot of insanity and craziness and dangerous world we live in in 2023 going into 2024. That's another story for another time. If you're out and about tonight, be safe, be aware. Get a designated driver or stay home and have a bonanza extravaganza at your own home. But more than anything, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, look out for each other. And again, situational awareness, stay close to your family and friends. I know I'm repeating that, but I'm very thankful for you guys and what's going on here in the IWC. And of course, for my family and friends, my wife my daughter, my granddaughter, my son-in-law, all my friends and family, and including my home at Paradise Alley Pro Wrestling. I have an unbelievable episode here for today with a lot of news and notes in history. Uh, remember our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Without him, none of this would be possible. And if he is for us, no one could be against us. Follow me on all social media platforms. You know what they are. Twitter, a.k.a. X, Instagram, Facebook, Gitter, Gab, Truth Social, Rumble, and we'll run over all the different handles once we get back here and, and off all the other social media platforms. Grab a snack, grab something to drink, kick back and relax because this is going to be a banger. All right, fans, as I said about the social media platforms, on Instagram, it's the Guardian of Chaos. On X, aka Twitter, it's at Big Daddy GOC, and the GOC stands for the Guardian of Chaos. I have two accounts on Facebook, Protigio Fidelis El Guardian, in honor of my heritage, and of course my mainstay, J Brony. For all you jabronis out there, no offense, man, J Brony. Follow me at Gitter, Gab, True Social, and soon we'll be going live and taking over the platform of Rumble. So, fans, we have a significant day in history today, not only in pro wrestling, but in the world, and, and we'll cover that at the end of the show. I have a lot of news and notes here to go through for your fans. This is going to be one of our better shows. I'm glad you made it back here today on Thanksgiving Eve, uh, uh, the day before Turkey Day. Gobble, gobble. Uh, so it's a special time of the season I want to start off by getting hydrated. You see, I'm repping the old school, world-class championship wrestling. What a territory. What a company back in the late 70s and early 80s. Even into the mid and late 80s when they kind of changed around there. Reunion Arena, the Sportatorium, Texas Stadium. It wasn't the, the Freebirds, the Von Erics. I mean, does it get much better than that? I don't think so as far as history. And speaking of that, I believe in a couple of weeks, the Von Erich movie... The Iron Claw will be coming out, and I heard it was unbelievable by listening to, to Kevin Von Erich and then seeing what his sons Marshall and Ross had to say about it, and then listening to the interview of uh, Zach Efron, who, who played, I believe he played Kevin Von Erich in the movie. Ah, a little water with lemon. I already had a nice double bag of... Uh, cup of black tea so fans again bear with me on this one you're going to want to stay here till the end there's no two ways about it we're at 1,000 subscribers or thereabouts 4,000 watch hours we're going to be going live here on YouTube instead of just live to tape two and a half thousand videos with my over 50 years of being a scout historian a researcher an agent a producer sweeper of floors promo man hype man smart mark that's right i say it every show and i'll say it again a mark i'm proud
proud to be a damn mark. We're all marks because we love the pro wrestling business. And my over three plus decades as a pro wrestling manager with dozens and dozens of Hall of Famers and heroes and legends and rookies and young lions. That's right. And I not only did I come out two or three times a night and all these cards all over the country, I took the fucking bumps too. And I know I've been pushing this a lot lately because a lot of people have been asking me. I'm 60 years old now, you know, no longer relevant except what I do here. But remember who I was, where I came from, and what I did. New England Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame, Paradise Alley Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame. Traveled all over this country. But the most important thing is I compare myself, and I'm not as good as them. I'm just putting myself in the class of the legendary greats, Captain Lou Albano, Classy Freddie Blassie, Bobby Heenan, Jim Cornette, Jimmy Hart, Gary Hart, all the unbelievable legendary managers that not only did what I did, but got in the ring and had the balls, the cojones to take the fucking bumps night after night. Let's remember that. No, I didn't sign a contract. But remember for what my character is and what I did as a manager in this business, and I'm proud of it. Thanks for listening to my rant there. We're six minutes in. School is in session. As I always say, let's get down to brass tacks because this is an unbelievable TV show here today. Podcast, reality show, whatever you want to call it. And again, I thank you guys from the bottom of my heart and I'm very thankful. November 22nd, 1922, as we start off here on Chaos Corner. This day, today in pro wrestling history, November 22nd, Billy Meesk defeats Joe Bailey in a tournament final to win the vacant Australian heavyweight title in Melbourne, Australia. The title had been vacant since 1915 when champion Clarence Weber retired. So think about that. The belt was vacated in 1915. They didn't get a champion until 1922. So do your math. I, I failed non-credit math in college at least twice. Yes, I went to college. Uh, who knew, right? November 22nd, 1950, Baron Miquel Leone defeats Enrique Torres in Los Angeles, California to become the recognized world heavyweight champion in Los Angeles and the Pacific North, North, Northwest. I almost said Northeast. Ending Torres' second reign and first respective reigns for Enrique, uh, uh, for a Baron Miquel Leone. November 22nd, 1954, Lord James Blears and Joe Pazanadak defeat Gene Kaniski and John Tolos for the NWA International TV Tag Team Titles in Los Angeles, California. Back into the time machine. November 22nd, 1955, the unbelievable legend himself, Ricky Dozan, defeats King Kong, no, not King Kong from the Godzilla movies, in a tournament final to become the first all-Asia heavyweight champion in Tokyo, Japan. Konnichiwa, bitches. Uh, origato from Chaos-san. Now, Ricky Dozan would hold that title until his death on December 8th, 1963. A banger of a year in 1963 for history. November 22nd, 1960. George Aiken wins the Madison Wrestling Club heavyweight title from Bob Brown in Winnipeg, Canada, Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada, ending Brown's second reign and beginning Aiken's third reign. How about that for history? I know, I'm a little rumbling, stumbling, bumbling. But come on, man. It's Thanksgiving Eve. I don't have to tell you and continue to go on with... The legendary story of what Bully Ray said to me, you know, from the Dudleys. Busted open radio. Perhaps one of the greatest tag teams of all time. Two-time Hall of Famer. I'm not going to tell you what Bully Ray said to me when it comes to spots and fucking up. Oh, I apologize for the cussing. Uh, uh, the cussing. Go back in previous shows <laughs> And you'll understand what I'm talking about. If you're a regular subscriber of mine, you know the story. But I know 95% of you are not subscribers, but you're watching the show. And as I always say, because of you know how analytics are, you know how technology is, 
I'm watching and I know that you know that I know you're watching. It comes up on my analytics. <laughs> Let that sink in. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. I know I'm a little off the hook. I am the guardian of chaos. Back into the time machine. November 22nd, 1961. Lord James Blears and Neff Maivia win their second NWA Hawaii Tag Team titles, defeating Shoulders Newman and Ted Travis, ending their second reign in Honolulu, Hawaii. Pehea wamele hinikane pupule wiki wiki. Aloha and mahalo for all my friends over on the islands. Back into the time machine as we forge ahead here on Chaos Corner. It's going to be an unbelievable show. You'll see by time's end. November 22nd, 1962. The fabulous kangaroos Al Costello and Roy Heffernan defeat Tony Balarzian and Maurice Lapointe for the Florida version of the NWA World Tag Team titles in Jacksonville, Florida. How about that for names to pronounce and remember? November 22nd, 1963. Billy Hines defeats Mikey Sharp, or Mickey Sharp, tomato, tomato, potato, potato, to win the NWA Gulf Coast Heavyweight title in Mobile, Alabama. Back into the time machine. November 22nd, 1968. The Assassins, Tom Renesto and Jody Hamilton, defeat Ramon and Alberto Torres for the NWA Georgia Tag Team titles in Atlanta, Georgia. Let's stay in November 22nd, 1968. Rocket and Flash Monroe defeat Don Carson and Dick Dunn to win the NWA Gulf Coast Tag Team titles in Dolphin, Alabama. November 22nd, 1969. Joe Scarpa, Joe Scarpa, a.k.a. Chief J. Strongbow, defeats the assassin number two, who is Tom Renesto, was Tom Renesto, in a tournament final in Atlanta, Georgia, to become the first NWA Georgia television champion. November 22nd, 1972. Rocket and Flash Monroe, who we just spoke about, defeat Rip Tyler and Eddie Sullivan to win the Gulf Coast version of the NWA United States Tag Team titles in Mobile, Alabama. Rewind this and you'll see that Rocket and Flash Monroe won the NWA Gulf Coast Tag Titles in Dolphin, Alabama, only to win the Gulf Coast version of the NWA United States Tag Team Titles, what, three years later? In Mobile, Alabama. Back into the time machine. November 22, 1974. Pampiro Furpo. That's the way I said it. The legendary wild man from the Himalayas, Pampiro Furpo, defeats John Tolos for the NWA America's Heavyweight title in Los Angeles, California. This begins Furpo's third reign and ends Tolos's seventh reign. Talk about two legends in the world of pro wrestling. Back into the time machine, November 22nd, 1976. Superstar Billy Graham defeats the American Dream Dusty Rhodes for the NWA Florida heavyweight title in West Palm Beach, Florida, ending Dusty's third reign at that point in his career. November 22, 1978. Mondo Guerrero defeats Larry Sharp for the NWA Hawaii heavyweight title in Honolulu, Hawaii. Mahalo. November 22nd, 1979, Tojo Yamamoto, Bobby Eaton, and the Secret Weapon defeat George Goulis, Ken Lucas, and Joey Rossi for the NWA World Six-Man Tag Team titles in Bowling Green, Kentucky. Let's stay on November 22nd, 1979. The Avenger defeats the Turk to win the NWA Central States heavyweight title in Kansas City, Kansas. Back into the time machine. November 22nd, 1980. 
Judy Martin defeats Princess Littleheart for the NWA United States Women's title in Atlanta, Georgia. November 22nd, 1982. Kevin Sullivan defeats Dusty Rhodes for the Florida version of the NWA Southern Heavyweight title in West Palm Beach, Florida, ending Dusty's seventh reign with that title. There was nothing like the Florida Territory. This is the NWA. As you see, I have a lot of territory notes from back in the days and when wrestling was truly unbelievable pro wrestling. Uh, you know, we're coming up on Thanksgiving. Uh, go back however many years it is to 1983. Uh, I believe on this date, November 22nd, 1983, when all over this country there were cards held from St. Paul, Minnesota, to Reunion Arena uh, and, and Dallas, uh, to Atlanta, Georgia, to the Superdome in Louisiana, to Greensboro for Starcade. Thousands upon thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands of fans attending live pro wrestling events, perhaps in the greatest era of pro wrestling. Do your research, do your due diligence. The business has changed forever since then. The inception of the uh, Hulkamania years and WrestleMania, which really were great for this business, of course. I mean, I loved that era. But 1983, Closed Circuit TV, Starcade started it all. And on that night, I mean, now there's there's no Thanksgiving shows. There's no tradition there of holiday shows. But back in the 80s, thousands flocked to the arenas for live events. Think about that. Do your research. And of course, Florida Championship Wrestling, perhaps one of the greatest territories of all time. I know I'm getting sidetracked here. November 22nd, 1984. Jimmy Golden defeats Austin Idol for the NWA Southeastern Heavyweight title in Birmingham, Alabama, beginning Golden's sixth reign. We'll stay in November 22nd, 1984. Invader 1 and 3 win the vacant WWC Tag Team titles over Super Medico One and Black Gordman and Bayamon Puerto Rico. No, no offense, De Nada, man. Okay, Faye, don't be offended. So I speak five different languages. That's why you're here. One man, unique, unedited, unscripted, raw dog for you, the fans. Where else do you get this kind of entertainment? And you don't have to fucking pay for it. I apologize. Back into the time machine here at Chaos Corner. November 22nd, 1987. The Midnight Rockers, Shawn Michaels and Marty Jannetty, defeat the Rock and Roll RPMs, Mike Davis and Tommy Lane, to win their second AWA Southern Tag Team titles in Memphis, Tennessee, ending the RPMs' fifth reign with those titles. How about that? Back into the time machine, November 22nd, 1989. Big Van Vader defeats Kanek, formerly El Kanek, I believe, for the Universal Wrestling Association World Heavyweight title in Mexico City, Mexico, ending Kanek's ninth reign with that title. True Lucha Libre legend. We'll stay in November 22nd, 1989. Jim Breaks defeats Kid McCoy to win the European lightweight title in Ipswich, England, across the pond, if you will. Breaks begins his 15th reign with that European light heavyweight title. Let that marinate. November 22nd, 1990. The WWF 4th Annual Survivor Series from the Hartford Civic Center in Hartford, Connecticut, here in the shadows of Titan Towers. It was the pay-per-view debut of Kane, The Undertaker. Now, not his debut in the WWF, because his debut bout in the WWF was against Paradise Alley Pro Wrestling owner in the WWF from 84 to 92, and that would be Mario Mancini. That was The Undertaker's debut in the WWF. But this 
was his pay-per-view debut at Survivor Series 1990, right here in the Constitution, Constitution State, where he was introduced, if you remember, as I said, Kane the Undertaker. This is considered one of the best Survivor Series of all time in the 37 years, uh, coming up on 37 years that the Survivor Series has been held. Also on that night, the debut of the gobbledygooker. Say that again. The debut of the gobbledygooker, who obviously ended up being Hector Guerrero. Let's get on to the card. Again, go out and check 1990, the fourth annual Survivor Series. Considered one of the best as far as talent, the teams. Uh, I have to agree. I, I thoroughly enjoyed that one. This one. The Ultimate Warriors, the team of the Ultimate Warrior, Animal and Hawk, known as the Legion of Doom at that time, the Texas Tornado, a.k.a. Kerry Von Erich, defeat the perfect team comprised of Mr. Perfect, Kurt Enning, and Demolition, Axe, Smash, and Crush. Now, the Ultimate Warrior was the sole survivor. 1990 Survivor Series from Hartford, Connecticut. The Million Dollar Team... Ted DiBiase, Kane the Undertaker, the Honky Tonk Man, and Greg the Hammer Valentine defeat the Dream Team combined and comprised of the American Dream, Dusty Rhodes, Coco Beware, and the Hart Foundation of Brett the Hitman Hart and Jim the Anvil Nightheart. Now, DiBiase was the sole survivor. Also, Survivor Series, 4th Annual, Hartford, Connecticut. The Visionaries... Rick Martell, the warlord and power and glory, of course, that's Hercules Hernandez and Paradise Alley Pro Wrestling head trainer, pretty Paul Roma. You see the connection between PAPW, the WWF, WCW? Does it get any fucking better than that? As far as learning, the sport, the industry, the business of pro wrestling? Because I don't think it does. They go on to defeat the Vipers. Jake the Snake Roberts, Superfly Jimmy Snuka, and the Rockers of Janetti and Michaels. The entire visionary team survived that bout. So again, Roma, the Warlord, Martel, and Hercules Hernandez, all survivors to move on at the fourth annual WWF Survivor Series. Let's stay in November 22nd, 1990. As we continue with the Survivor Series from the Hartford Civic Center. The Hulkamaniacs, Hulk Hogan, Hacksaw Jim Duggan, the Big Boss Man, and Tugboat defeat the natural disasters of Earthquake, Haku, Dino Bravo, and the Barbarian. Talk about mass humanity. Look at the names in that match. Now, Hogan obviously was the sole survivor. We move on to the next match in the Survivor Series, the traditional Survivor Series, not the garbage we have now, war games, this and that. I'm not shitting on the product. I'm giving you the good, the bad, and the ugly. The alliance comprised of Nikolai Volkov, Hariba, Tito Santana, Luke and Butch, the Bushwhackers, defeat the Mercenaries, Sergeant Slaughter, Boris Zukov, and the Orient Express of Mr. Sato and Pat Tanaka. Tito Santana was the sole survivor. Now to wrap it up for the 1990 Survivor Series, Hulk Hogan, the Ultimate Warrior, and Tito Santana defeat Ted DiBiase, Rick Martel, the Warlord, and Power and Glory, Hercules and Paul Roma. This was a match, as you fans know if you know your history, that featured the sole survivors from the preceding matches, bouts if you will. And the end result was Hulk Hogan and the Ultimate Warrior were the ultimate survivors. So, so briefly before I move on, because I have an unbelievable show here with history. Look at the talent from the 1990 Survivor Series, the fourth annual. The debut of Kane the Undertaker. The Ultimate Warrior. The Road Warriors. Kerry Von Erich. Kurt Henning. Demolition, all three members, Ted DiBiase, the Honky Tonk Man, Greg the Hammer Valentine, the Heart Foundation, Dusty Rhodes, Rick Martell, the Warlord, Power and Glory, Jake the Snake, the Superfly, the Rockers, 
And then that, that mammoth bout between Hogan, Hacksaw Duggan, the big boss man, the tugboat, Earthquake, Haku, Dino Bravo, the Barbarian. I mean, what the fuck? Nikolai Volkov, the Bushwhackers, the Orient Express, Sergeant Slaughter. Are you listening to the legends, the names, the Hall of Famers? Again, the late 70s. I'll even go with the middle 70s, the late 70s, all through the 80s into the early 90s, where it started getting a little wonky. No better time in pro wrestling. They rebounded the industry and the business, say, maybe to the mid to late 90s. Once we got into the early 2000s and these last 15 years, decade, two decades, respect all the guys and gals and the talent. They're breaking their ass. They can only go by what it is. But it has really turned out to be not what pro wrestling was meant to be all about. That's just my opinion. Inbox me, email me, ask me a question, leave a comment, and I'll give you my explanation why. And if this doesn't prove to you, I don't know what the fuck does. Back into the time machine, November 22nd, 1991. Los Infernales... Pirato Morgan, Santanico, and MS1 defeat Los Brazos, El Brazo, Brazo de Plata, and Brazo de Oro in a tournament final to become the first, the first CMLL World Trios champions in Mexico City, Mexico. So if you want to find out where AEW in current 2023 and no one says six-man tag team matches anymore, six-man tag team tournaments, uh, six-man world tag team champions. This is where it came from all these years ago, 1991, CMLL, and their first trios champions, Los Infernales. Put that in your pipe and smoke it for tidbits and useless bits of information. That's what you get here on Chaos Corner. Let's stay in November 22nd, 1991. Hollywood John Tatum and Rugged Rod Price defeat Steve Simpson, who actually looked like one of the Von Erichs at that point, in a handicap match to win the Global Wrestling Federation Tag Team titles in Dallas, Texas. Now, you remember, world-class championship wrestling into the late 80s uh, changed a lot. The Von, a lot of the Von Erichs and the tragedies and Fritz had passed away and so on and so forth or changed bookers with me and Tal and this is what you came up with was Global Wrestling Federation so it really turned into a product that didn't last that long just to give you some sidebars back into the time machine as the chain slowly falls off here at Chaos Corner and you know my background read the information on this channel <laughs> 25 years behind the walls with society's worst. Oh, uh, thank you for serving the public. November 22nd, 1992, Ultimo Dragon defeats El Samurai for the IWGP Junior Heavyweight title in Tokyo, Japan. On that same card, Scott Norton and Tony Haume. Haume. Does anyone know who that is, the team with Scott Norton in 1992? Tony Halme, Bueller, Bueller, anyone? He would go on to be Ludwig Borga in the WWF. How about that? Norton and Ludwig defeated the Steiner brothers, Ricky and Scotty, for the IWGP World Tag Team titles. Stand by. We go into the time machine here on Chaos Corner. November 22nd, 1992. And I cover everything from pillar to post and coast to coast and border to border here on Chaos Corner, the YouTube channel. And you'll see what these results. I dug deep for today's episode, for today's show, to give you the territories, the independence, and the big time. Whatever you want to call it, it's all pro wrestling. November 22nd, 1992. AJ Freely defeats Bruno Becker for the New Zealand heavyweight title. Let's stay in November 22nd, 1992. Oh, slap nuts. Jeff Jarrett wins a battle royal for the USWA Unified Heavyweight title in Memphis, Tennessee, pinning Jerry the King Lawler to win the belt for the first time in his career. The last outlaw, Double J, slap nuts, if you will. 
The belt was vacated, if you remember correctly, by the macho man Randy Savage when the WWF broke off their working relationship with the USWA. There was always something going on with Vince Jr., wasn't there, you son of a bitch? November 22nd, 1993, the Nature Boy, no, 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 not Ric Flair, Buddy Landell defeats said Jeff Jarrett for the USWA Southern Heavyweight title in Memphis, Tennessee, ending Jarrett's 10th reign with that belt. Back into the time machine. November 22nd, 1995. Tex Slazinger defeats Brian Lawler Christopher for the vacant USWA heavyweight title in Memphis, Tennessee. Now, the title had been held up for roughly nine days earlier due to outside interference in a match between Slazinger and Christopher. Christopher had previously been champion 19 times. Too Cool, Too Sexy, Grandmaster Sexy, Brian Lawler, Brian Christopher, 19 times the USWA Heavyweight Champion. Let that marinate. Back into the time machine, November 22nd, 1997. Quinn Magnum defeats T. Rantula for the NWA Pro Wrestling Express Heavyweight title in North Versailles, Pennsylvania. On that same card, Bubba the Bulldog wins the NWA PWX TV title by forfeit, forfeit, did I say that right? From Vince Kaplick. Remember that, forfeit. The wrong crowd, comprised of local New England star, Brian Anthony and Paul Atlas defeat Gator and Colonel Payne for the NWA PWX Tag Team Titles. That's what I do for research. That's how far I dig for you guys on this date in pro wrestling history for this program, and that's how much it means to me. My motivation, my passion. Back into the time machine, November 22nd, 1997. Robert Thompson and Chris Cole defeat Vic and Dick Grimes for the All-Pro Wrestling Tag Team Titles in Hayward, California. November 22nd, 1999, in the midst of the Monday Night Wars waged between WCW Monday Nitro and WWF Monday Night Raw, Nitro on this night in 1999 only garnered a 3.4 rating from a show in Auburn Hills, Michigan. 3.4 blows away every program here today in 2023, so let that sink in. While WWF Raw is war posted a 5.5 rating with a show from Syracuse, New York. Everybody talks about ratings and putting asses in seats and ticket sales. Think about this when I talk about this in this state in pro wrestling history and what I've posted previously on this channel. Let's stay in November 22nd, 1999. Viano 3 defeats Atlantis to win the CMLL World Light Heavyweight title in Tampico, Mexico. November 22nd, 2002, 2002, from Queens, New York. And boy, did I have many great matches in Queens, New York. Wow, what a hotbed back in the day. Bam Bam Bigelow loses to the homicidal, suicidal, genocidal Sabu for the U.S. Extreme Wrestling heavyweight title there in Queens, New York. Sabu also defeated the Sandman on that same night for the U.S. XW United States title, which was vacated after Sabu won the heavyweight title, which led into a match between the Amazing Red, who went over on Quiet Stormed, Deranged, and Grim Reefer for said USXW United States title on that night, November 22nd, 2002 in Queens, New York. On that same card, 187 Homicide defeats Xavier for the USXW Extreme Heavyweight title, and then Homicide defeats Amazing Red for the United States title. Changes galore, championships galore, titles galore on this night in 2002. 
also on that card. Wayne and the Trekkie defeat the Boogie Knights for the USXW Tag Team titles. Who else brings you this kind of information? That's what I do. And this is what I enjoy doing. Well, I hope you guys are having a lot of fun. Because I know I am. I'm a stress reliever in this day and age. We're only uh, 30 minutes in. I'm, I'm not done yet. Stick with me to the end. This is one of the better shows you're going to get over the last several weeks. Tomorrow is Thanksgiving. Uh, even though there's a lot of history on Thanksgiving in the world of pro wrestling, I'm not sure if I'll be here. And if I am, I'll be here late to put up something for you, the fans. November 22nd, 2002. Al Catraz defeats Primetime Peterson for the World Class Wrestling Alliance heavyweight title in Lemon Grove, California. November 22nd, 2003. Raven defeats Just Incredible for the 3PW heavyweight title in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Again, fans, you won't get information like this anywhere else. Back into the time machine. Let's stay in November 22nd, 2003. Steve Madison defeats Scoot Andrews to win the NWA Florida heavyweight title in St. Petersburg, Florida. We'll stay in 2003, November 22nd. Vinny Viagra, he's got nothing on me. And Billy Maverick defeat the Redneck Express comprised of Chris Vega and the Rebel for the NWA Bluegrass tag team titles in Sayersville, Kentucky. We'll stay in November 22nd, 2003. Parental advisory uh, for this show sometimes too. Consisting of Joey Grunge and Kid USA defeat the unbelievable legendary team of the SATs, Jose and Joel Maximo. The real, the original SAT, Jose and Joel Maximo. Big shouts out to the Maximos. For the NWA Midwest Tag Team titles in Topeka, Kansas. Grizz wins a gauntlet match, last eliminating Mark Sterling to win the vacant NWA Kansas heavyweight title. We're going to continue here on November 22nd, 2003. Brandon Young defeats Sean Donovan for the Independent Wrestling Federation American title in West Patterson, New Jersey. November 22nd, 2005. Pomp and Circumstance comprised of Ace Rockwell and Sean Tempers defeat Tank and Iceberg for the NWA Georgia Tag Team titles in Saudi Daisy, Tennessee. Well, how about that for a name of a town? Back into the time machine, fans. IWC, if you will. November 22nd, 2007. 1950s British wrestler Thomas Moore passes away. Now, Thomas Moore wrestled using the ring name Jack Dempsey, the legendary boxer. So let that sink in. Uh, listen, Thomas Morris, Thomas Moore, if you will, known as Jack Dempsey across the pond. He was very popular with the fans. And he was a former British welterweight champion. So rest in peace, Thomas Moore. And again, the tidbit of information there is he used the ring name Jack Dempsey. Now how about that? Again, I dig deep for these shows. November 22nd, 1984. We're going back to go forward or forward to go back. Over 16,000 fans jammed the St. Paul Civic Center in Minneapolis, Minnesota. On that card in 1984, Rick Martell defends the AWA World Heavyweight title over Billy Robinson. The Road Warriors defend their AWA World Tag Team titles over... Boom Boom Bundy and Crusher Blackwell. Now remember, here's the facts. Bundy couldn't use the name at that point, King Kong Bundy, because Bruiser Brody, a.k.a. King Kong Brody, was already in the territory and using that moniker. Who else would know that except the GOC? On that same card, Greg Gagne defeats Sheik Adnan Al KC in a steel cage. And the fabulous ones, 
beat Luke Graham and Steve Regal, all on that card in 1984. Over 16,000 fans talk about territories and hotbed and putting asses in seats. That was the AWA on this date, November 22nd, 1984. Let's go forward to go back and back to go forward. November 22nd, 2010. The Miz. That's right, The Miz. Cashes in the money in the bank and defeats Randy Orton to win the WWE title. Now, it wasn't just known, and I don't have that on here for my notes, just because The Miz cashed in the money in the bank over Orton back here on November 22nd, 2010 in the time machine. Do you remember that little girl they put on the camera and it's been all over for the last decade, last 15 years, of that little girl that looks like a, a, a leftover miserable Greta Thornburg with that, that face of anger and evil in the crowd? It's a very infamous uh, picture of the little girl and the reaction to The Miz on that night, November 22nd, 2010. Go out. You can find it online. And let's go... Uh, forward to go back. November 22nd, 1998. WCW presents, and uh, I don't know why I'm saying this again because of the state of affairs here and current day and where we're headed in my opinion. WCW presents World War III from the Palace in Auburn Hills, Michigan. On that card, Kevin Nash wins a 60-man Three ring battle royal to earn a title match at the upcoming Starcade. Nash eliminated Hall and Luger to get the win and that number one spot to go on to Starcade here on November 22nd, 1998. 60 man three ring. Wow. On that same card, Diamond Dallas Page defeats Bret the Hitman Hart to retain the WCW United States title. Billy Kidman defeats Juventud Guerrera to win the WCW Cruiserweight title. The WCW TV champ, the Wizard, the Ocho, Le Champion, the Young, young Lion, Rainmaker, Painmaker, JAS, whatever the fuck you want to call him, White, I don't know. Chris Jericho with Ralphus. You remember Ralphus? He had summer teeth somewhere in his pocket, somewhere in his mouth. Uh, somewhere on his nightstand. But Chris Jericho with Ralphus defeats Bobby Duncan Jr. to retain, obviously, the TV championship. Rick and Scott Steiner battle each other and it ends in a no contest after interference from the NWO to Sweet and Goldberg. How about that? Ernest DeCap Miller and Sonny Ono defeat Perry Saturn and Kaz Hayashi on that same card, November 22nd, 1998, World War III from WCW, as we continue here on Chaos Corner. We go forward to go back on November 22nd, 1984, from the Greensboro Coliseum, the second annual Starcade. Now remember the previous year I discussed earlier, 1983 Starcade, the first, very first, was on closed circuit TV. Long before WWF WrestleMania won. Put that in perspective. Jim Crockett Promotions presents Starcade, the million dollar challenge. Remember, second annual Starcade here. Greensboro, unbelievable territory, unbelievable area. The Million Dollar Challenge, which saw Ric Flair defeat the American Dream Dusty Rhodes to retain the NWA World Heavyweight Championship to win the $1 million. When special ref Smokin' Joe Frazier stops the match due to excessive bleeding. Now, where am I going with this if you're still here with me at 40 minutes in? Where am I going with this? The referee stopped the match due to excessive bleeding between Dusty Rhodes and Ric Flair, two of the greatest ever. Ric Flair, perhaps the greatest ever. What did we just see this past week, this past weekend at AEW Full Gear? And everyone's bragging about it. Hey, it is what it, what it was. and It was entertaining, and it was hardcore for what it was. And both guys worked their asses off. And I'm talking about Hangman Page and Swerve Strickland. 
and the blood and the graphic and the brutality of what happened here in 2023. Bleeding in the mouth, so on and so forth. Chains, cinder blocks, everything you could think of. A 30-minute match. An unbelievable, incredible, hardcore, gory, unbelievable match. So I will say that to say this because I tell it like it is. But in today's day in business, hepatitis, HIV, wellness, talk about unhealthy. And people will say, oh, well, what about the storyline? Uh, you got to change with the times. You got to evolve. It was the greatest match in history, the greatest Texas match in history, maybe for this era. But look back to when it all started. Look back to the history, the legacy. And I'm going to say that to say this. A million dollar match, kayfabe work or not, between Flair and Rhodes for the heavyweight championship of the fucking world. And it was stopped due to excessive bleeding. Do you get my point? Do you understand what I'm saying? Before you leave a comment, think about it. Go back and watch it on YouTube and you compare AEW and what happened this past weekend at Full Gear between Strickland and Hangman Page. I'm just telling you. That's my viewpoint. I give you the good, the bad, and the ugly. If you don't like it, change the fucking channel. On that same card, NWA TV champion Tully Blanchard beats Ricky Steamboat to retain his title and win the $10,000. Think about how much money was on the line on this card and how many fans it drew. On that same card, the bitter feud between Paul Jones and Jimmy Valiant ends when Jones defeats Jimmy Valiant in a loser leaves town tuxedo street fight. Ivan and Nikita Koloff defeat Ole Anderson and Keith Larson. Wahoo McDaniel downs superstar Billy Graham to retain the NWA United States Championship. The Raging Bull Manny Fernandez defeats Black Bart to win the Brass Knuckles title. On that same card, Denny Brown defeats Mike Davis for the NWA World Junior Heavyweight Championship. Think about what I said about Flair and Rhodes and the excessive bleeding. Just want you to compare it. Let's move on and go forward to go back here in the time machine. I'll try to keep this under an hour. November 22nd, 1984. World Class Championship Wrestling, but not from the Sportatorium. From the Reunion Arena with over 15,000 fans for Star Wars on that card in 1984, on this date in pro wrestling history, Gentleman Chris Adams defeats Kevin Von Erich in a no disqualification match. Mike Von Erich defeats Gino Hernandez by disqualification. Terry Gordy beat Killer Khan with Kerry Von Erich as the special guest referee. The Fantastics defeat the PYT Express of Coco Beware and Norvell Austin. Stella Mae French defeats Nicola Roberts, that's right, Nicola Roberts, a.k.a. the lovely baby doll. And Carrie Von Erich and Iceman King Parsons defeat Jake Roberts and Kelly Kaniski in front of 15,000 fans at Reunion Arena. We're almost done, fans. You're going to want to stay to the end for this date in history. Not necessarily pro wrestling history, so I'm giving it away right there. November 22nd, 2020. A mere three and a half years ago when all the bullshit with the pandemic and lockdowns and the government control started here in the world and in this country. The Undertaker's fourth and final Survivor Series on this date in pro wrestling history for November 22nd, back in 2020. Seems like a long time ago because of what we've gone through in this world, but it's not that long ago. Now, The Undertaker's first appearance, as we went through here earlier, at Survivor Series, was in 1990. On this night, three years ago, three and a half years ago, The Undertaker was introduced by Vince. And if you remember... They had a hologram of Paul Bera appearing in the ring. Oh, Undertaker Paul Bearer. With the urn, the hologram, you remember that? You know what sticks out more than anything? It was in front of a fucking empty arena. No fans in attendance due to the COVID. 
the 19, the virus, the pandemic, whatever you want to say, and what it costs our youth and this country and this world and where we're trending and heading to now. I try not to get too political. But as I end off the show, you're going to see on what happened on this date in history. So again, November 22nd, 2020, The Undertaker's fourth and final Survivor Series, the hologram of Paul Bearer, no fans in attendance because of the pandemic. The Undertaker ended up in Survivor Series with a 13-5 and overall record. Let that sink in. They talk about the streak in WrestleMania. So The Undertaker, 13-5 and in his final Survivor Series with no fans. What a shit way to go out. This ends the pro wrestling portion. We are 50 minutes in. I won't take up too much more of your time. And again, I hope you stayed here to the end. I greatly appreciate it. It means a lot to me. November 22nd, 1962. 60 years ago. Today is the 60th anniversary. Not even a good word to use. On the assassination of of President John F. Kennedy, that's right, JFK, who was shot in Dallas, Texas by that son of a bitch, Lee Harvey Oswald. Now there's a lot of rumors and speculation on who was involved, the government, the FBI, the CIA, who knows? Only the big man knows the truth. 60 years ago, November 22nd, 1962, I would be born a year later this historic event, JFK being shot by Lee Harvey Oswald. As the story goes, if you know your research, and there's an incredible documentary on it now, Lee Ruby ended up killing Oswald. Now this made what TV what it is today. It made the career of Walter Cronkite. Remember, TV had only been around, black and white, had only been around for 12 years at that point. TV was invented in the 50s early 50s so let, let that marinate black and white TVs Walter Cronkite and the way the media and social media is now and what happened with Oswald and being interviewed and, and, and mere hours later and how quickly the CIA had caught Oswald what was it about 90 minutes, if I know my history, an hour and a half later, the cops, the CIA, the FBI, whatever, had caught Oswald. And that's because he shot and killed a police officer before he shot and killed JFK. And was roaming the streets aimlessly. I believe they found him in a movie theater. If I know my history, and I had to present this on this date in pro wrestling history because what it meant to this country and the world. It really boggles the mind and, and what happened and how quickly the Secret Service was able to find Oswald. When today we can't find people for days and days and hours and hours and it goes on and on with all these incredible, disastrous, uh, uh, heinous things that happen in today's society. It's almost like how could the Secret Service, FBI, CIA be more on top of it and more in tuned and better equipped with less technology and media back then in the 60s than today in 2023. This isn't conspiracy. These are facts. And considering where today you separate the president, the vice president, they have bunkers, war rooms, they can't be in the same place, decoys. How is it that Lyndon B. Johnson, the vice president of the time, was in the same car with President Kennedy. I get he's from Dallas, Texas as well. I understand that. And what Jacqueline Onassis had to do and what kind of unbelievable woman she was moving forward. Let all that sink in. I know it's a lot to be thrown at you after you know 50 minutes of, of this date in pro wrestling history for a distraction. But the even more important history, 60 years ago, November 22nd, 1962, the assassination of JFK by Lee Harvey Oswald and what it did for TV and how was our government secret service so in tune to catch the murderer so quickly 
And then he even held a press conference himself, uh, Oswald. And then later on, obviously, Jack Ruby, I said Lee Ruby, Jack Ruby killing him. Just think about the times. I know the rearview mirror is smaller for a reason than the windshield. I say it all the time. I get it. And then Johnson and Kennedy being together could have very easily had the top two in this country taken out at the same time. We don't know if he acted alone. Go out and watch the series and the documentary. You'll find it amazing. But I just wanted to bring that to you, the fans here. Because, uh, again, I'm 60 years old. This is within my lifetime, just about. And I'll say that to say this, because I tell it like it is. I can't thank you guys enough for being here. I will be back. I'm glad you stayed to the end. We're 55 minutes in, coming up on 56 minutes. Thank you, guys. Don't you dare miss it. It's actually quiet here at Chaos Corner. Who knew? The silence is deafening. <laughs>